My name is Alden Burke. I'm the program coordinator here at Design for America's national office. Um, the first thing I want to do is, before we really dive into everything, I want to introduce everyone who's going to be presenting on this call and sort of go over the agenda of what the next uh, 45 minutes are going to look like. So without further ado, again, my name is Alden Burke. Um, I work in the Design for America's national office. We run out of Northwestern University um, in Chicago. You'll also be hearing from Michael Sanchez and Albert Escobedo. Um, both of them are current Design for America students at the University of Texas in Austin. We also have Devika Patel. Devika is a DFA um, alumni board member. Devika graduated, was a student at Stanford, now lives in San Francisco um, and is working at the Better Lab. And we also have Deborah Daly. Deborah uh, just joined the DFA Advisory Committee recently. Um, Deborah has been with us in terms of a partner capacity. Um, and so thank you all of uh, all four of you for joining us today um, and sharing out about your work. So again, next 45 minutes, what we're going to do, we'll start off, um, I'll introduce Design for America, share a little bit more about uh, what DFA is, where it is, um, and give you a little bit more of a framework and background. Next, you'll hear from Michael and Albert to really, they'll be presenting about a student project that they did um, in collaboration with the YMCA to really demonstrate the, the benefits of working with the students student um, designers and partnering with them. We'll also pass it off to Devika, who will talk about um, the growing alumni network um, and really be talking about how Design for America translates from the sort of student higher education framework into um, this sort of new modern workforce. And lastly, Deb will close us out um, and speak from, again, the partner perspective of what are really the benefits of partnering with Design for America and working with the students to bring design thinking into any organization or project. So without further ado, um, I'm going to jump in and again uh, tell you all a little bit more about Design for America. So DFA started 10 years ago um, at Northwestern University by faculty founder Liz Gerber, who's pictured here. Um, Liz was a professor uh, working with students, and something that she was really noticing was that while students were learning the design process and design thinking in the classroom, um, it was really abstract, and they were really feeling like they weren't having moments where they could go out into the community and really apply what they were doing to make changes um, in their community about things that they cared about, really using design for social impact. Um, it was really meaningful for them. And so what Liz and some of these students set out to do was to create a sort of student-run organization where um, students from across uh, majors and disciplines and interests were working in interdisciplinary teams, working collaboratively, and then using the design process that they were really learning in the classroom, taking it out into the community, partnering with different organizations, um, and using their design skills to uh, create social impact projects. So as she says here, right, students learn best through practice, and opportunities for that are um, relatively limited in higher education. So DFA really set out to change this. That was all happening in 2009. Now, 10 years later, um, DFA is a national organization. Um, in 2018, we received the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award. Um, and we were rewarded this really for the way that DFA trains, supports, and galvanizes innovators, innovators being students, alumni, professionals, sort of at any, any point of their career. Um, to use design for positive social impact. DFA also is a proven model that instills community, it encourages creativity, and it builds capacity to take on any challenge with the people who participate. Um, and DFA is really imagining the day when leaders um, are using design for social good. So uh, in 2009, right, we were just on uh, Northwestern University. Now, we, Design for America is at uh, 41 different studios across the country. Um, I do want to add that, as a reminder, this is a total volunteer opportunity, right? So students aren't getting class credit for this. They're not getting paid for this. It's not an internship. Um, it is solely based on their drive and their passion for um, social impact work. So again, we have 41 studios with new studios launching every semester. Um, during each year, we have about 1,000 active students in the network um, working on projects, working on teams. Um, again, 200 projects usually registered per year. Um, and then again, we have, as Design for America started as a program that was happening in undergraduate schools, um, of course, those students graduate. Um, so now, I think in the spring, we will have over 4,000 alumni um, throughout the country and beyond. And again, uh, Devika will tell you a little bit more about uh, who the alumni are, uh, what they're doing, and how they use design thinking in the workplace. 
So now you know a little bit more about where DFA is, um, who we are. I really want to get into sort of uh, what, what DFA does. Um, again, really the bread and butter of DFA is student-led projects using design thinking to create social impact projects, um, going out, partnering with the community. And I think one of the best ways to sort of translate this is um, through a story. Um, so in 2016, uh, this is Design for America at Northwestern University. The team and studio partnered with um, an organization, the Senior Center, out in the Chicagoland area um, because folks were f uh, facing really bad flooding. Um, so what the team did was uh, went and talked to these seniors who uh, had some mobility issues and were losing a lot of the things that they loved that were in storage and basement sort of areas because of the flooding. And they didn't have this sort of mobility to be able to move some of these things. So throughout the semester, the team sort of really immersed themselves in the community, in the people they were working with, did research, and then eventually um, prototyped and built and tested and then eventually implemented um, something they call flood rug. So what they designed was essentially a waterproof tarp um, that had a drawstring around the edges that people could lay on the basement floor under their sort of furniture, anything that they wanted to, to safeguard from the water damage. And then when there was a flood warning, just go downstairs, sort of pull the drawstring up um, and protect their, their items. And so what the students did was after they designed this, they then passed it off to the community partners, and then these flood rugs were implemented in many houses um, in the area, in the community that they were working in, um, to really address and tackle that challenge of um, damage from flooding. And so DFA projects um, are happening at this like local scale, um, and sometimes the project pass-off um, is given to the community partner that they work with. Sometimes the projects that students work on go on to create um, organizations um, of their own. So Jerry the Bear um, is a, uh, an animatronic sort of toy that teaches children about um, learning to how to cope with their diabetes. Um, they're running out of Sprouts Howl organization um, and doing really great work. So this is also a little bit of an overview of um, the projects that happened in 2019. There were 247 projects that were registered spanning uh, disciplines from healthcare, education, economy, and the environment. Um, and again, students are going out into um, their communities, partnering with people to really tackle um, problems that are going on. So some of the how can we's are really the problems that um, these students were working with. So the first one here is how can we help YMCA recruit responsible lifeguards who are reflective of the community they serve? Again, Michael and Albert will touch upon this sort of um, when they present. How might we combat stigma that surrounds being visually impaired through restaurant accommodations? And how can we create a dialogue between local government and its constituents to improve trust. So these how can are really spanning across disciplines, um, a range of topics uh, that are happening at any one time in the DFA network. So that's a little bit about the projects. Um, something that DFA does is also give students the tools and training to really uh, implement the design process uh, with the organizations that they're partnering with. So on the left here, uh, you see the process guide. This is a sort of how can we um, book, uh, sort of gives all of the information about the DFA design process, um, specifically a six step process where students are learning how to identify problems with uh, community partners, immersing themselves in those communities to learn um, about the people and the problems at hand, not sort of designing based off of assumptions, and then reframing based on their research. Um, it also is teaching students how to ideate, how to build and test and eventually implement um, prototypes that they can then pass off to their partners. We also have things like mock-ups and team canvassing and uh, empathy maps that you can see in the top right here. Again, these are sort of smaller tools that teams um, use and learn while partnering with DFA and then bring to the partner organizations that they work with um, to really teach uh, and hone the design process and their skills. And then I think one of the biggest uh, tools for the DFA community that we have and share with uh, organizations that we partner with is the network. Um, we are a nationwide network of thousands of people who all are passionate and insightful and come from different backgrounds and expertise. Um, and so whether it's through programs and physically and meeting up with studios or digitally through webinars like this, when you partner with um, any DFA studio, you're really partnering with the network. And so getting all of those resources of all of those people involved. Um, just the last bit. Uh, so I talked a little bit about uh, projects that were happening at a local scale. We also do nationally sponsored projects um, that are sort of increasing the scale and happening across the, the network at any one semester. Um, so we partner with people like PNG, the YMCA, Compass Group and Humana, to name a few. And this is when 
do you have any national partners with these organizations to address a problem that they're having? Um, at the YMCA, the most recent project was, um, again, lifeguard recruitment and retention sort of at YMCAs across the nation. Five DFA teams were selected via an application process uh, and then worked closely with their local YMCAs to sort of tackle this problem throughout the semester. What's really exciting about these projects for students is it brings scale, reach, and expertise from the partner organization. Um, and it also, for the partners, what it brings is new insights, new research, and then it also teaches the partners more often than not um, the design process that can be applied to sort of any problem or project that they're working on in their organization. Here we have uh, the sort of syllabus that runs the semester um, of these national projects. Um, so it is a 12-week uh, sort of design process where, again, students are partnering with the organization, really immersing themselves to get to know the challenge space at hand, um, doing research, and then really implementing their design thinking and skills to ideate, build, test, and then eventually present um, their solution at an expo. All of the teams go to the headquarter uh, partner organizations and they share out um, and there's real project pass off in that moment. Um, so a really great opportunity for uh, partner organizations to uh, work with DFA students. Um, to really sort of demonstrate the impact of national projects, I'm gonna pass it off to um, Michael and Albert who will share their experience uh, working with the YMCA. So you two, you wanna take it off? Yes, thanks Alden, thanks for passing it off. Um, so we are the UT Austin Studio for Design for America. We're some of the student leaders that worked on last semester's national project, and I'm currently working on this semester's national project. All right, so the YMCA has a long-established lifeguard program, um, but that positive environment didn't necessarily translate to, to a retention of lifeguards. Uh, so we worked with our local YMCA headquarters starting late spring 2019. Um, with most of our primary research and design process last fall. So, yeah, the project existed to improve the recruitment and retention of lifeguards in the YMCA. Our first major meeting, we were actually able to bring in HR, aquatics directors, lifeguard managers, and even lifeguards that was uh, part of DFA Nationals uh, process act called a uh, desirability test. And the Desirability test, we, we wanted to come in with basically a really solid knowledge of the scene. Um, so we tapped our networks to see what the Austin lifeguard scene was like and what how the lifeguards worked and in different environments. And we were able to get a really solid idea so that when we came into the meeting, um, we already had a bunch of notes synthesized. Uh, this is, next slide and fly it after. Um, and we were able to even visit some lifeguard training um, with kind of atypical lifeguards. So the, the, a lot of the lifeguards were high school, college age. These were older lifeguards. We observed the environment and we took that back to our classroom. Next slide. So we were able to synthesize everything up on Jamboard. Next slide. And really figure out what some common themes were. Next slide. And we took those themes into the desirability test and had a really productive conversation. After that, we were actually able to start constructing some how can we statements uh, based on what we heard so far uh, from the Y. And we ended up putting them on a matrix. Next slide. And we were in between uh, two very different directions about scholarships. Um, it was important that we centered lifeguards throughout, so we wanted to look at a generating a persona that could kind of capture a lot of the lifeguards we talked to, and that's how we got Matthew. Matthew is your traditional Boy Scout lifeguard. Um, he's on the swim team, fairly upper middle class. Um, and the quote at the end here really captures Matthew's mentality is whether or not I return depends on the people I know coming back. Um, and that fits pretty well with what we'd heard from the YMCA so far. They were saying stuff like, uh, next slide. They were saying if you don't quit the job, you quit the people. And they were also saying, like, if there's not a high jump of payment, building loyalty, building a team, and building a family would help people lifeguard. Um, those made sense for Matthew, but not all the lifeguards we were talking to were like, 
were reflecting Matthew. So we wanted to push our YMCA to consider a different type of lifeguard, a type of lifeguard that we had seen that they weren't focused on, and that was Natalie. Yeah, so say hello to Natalie. Um, Natalie was one of the users we discovered in our user research that the Y didn't initially take into account. And I'm gonna run you through some of the challenges that Natalie faces. Um, Natalie doesn't have all the resources she needs to get a higher education. And as you can see, Natalie didn't, in our, in our journey, uh, Natalie didn't have the opportunity of attending a scouts program. Um, and so she has to take lifeguard training during her recruitment process, as well as manage uh, babysitting uh, to save for college and doing well in school. Um, and one of the things that was especially harming was that during her high school lifeguarding um, process, she was having to completely focus in on um, where she needed to designate her time. Uh, one of the one of the quotes that she gave us was, "I tried applied, I tried applying to different scholarships, but I really tried with ones I felt like I could get." Um, she had to really zero in on exactly what she needed to do because she didn't have a lot of time to do many things that she wanted to do. Um, and even after high school, she'll be working as a lifeguard, but she'll be needing to do so to uh, fund her higher education um, and balance school and work and make sure that she doesn't face food insecurity. So overall, Natalie doesn't have enough financial resources to be comfortable financially when she attends college. Um, and so what we know, right? Natalie needs resources for her future. She's looking for the greatest opportunity to get these resources, but she doesn't see the YMCA as the greatest opportunity for this. Um, and so one of the insights that we came across throughout our research process was, but the city pays $15 as opposed to 950 that the YMCA was, was paying. And so something we always thought about when we were ideating a solution. So we came up with the problem statement, how can we make the YMCA the most attractive option for Natalie? We need to make sure that Natalie could find the value she was seeking without having to increase the overall pay of the lifeguards. And so we took this problem statement and ran a few of our ideas by our YMCA st stakeholders to see if the solutions we were thinking about were possible in a feasibility test. Uh, and some of the ideas that we ran by them were setting up a system where lifeguards could, could organically set up community hangouts and a scholarship program. Um, and throughout this process, we were able to get some really valuable feel, feedback that enabled us to come up with our current solution, which was invest in me and invest in you. Um, and so the way that Invest in Me, Invest in You works is it's a hybrid scholarship and endowment fund that was created to meet the needs of lifeguards who wanted to attend a vacational program or college. Um, and so the way it works is they would set aside a portion of their check into an endowment fund that would fund a scholarship. And um, it was intended for people of any age that were lifeguards that wanted to continue uh, working on their education. So if they wanted to attend a medical vocational program to become an ENT, or if they wanted to attend in a traditional uh, college setting. Um, and so our stakeholders and our team both thought that the solution was really important in order to provide the YMCA with the value that people like Natalie needed. And so as you can see now, Natalie, um, she doesn't have to worry so much about uh, providing that financial stability because she has the financial support to pursue her higher education aspirations through the YMCA. Um, so Looks a little something like this. She now has to do the same things that she was doing before becoming a lifeguard, so preparing for certification. But during high school, she feels a little bit more secure about um, what she's doing. And um, she'll be putting aside her paycheck to the Invest in Me, Invest in You program and applying for those traditional scholarships. And when she gets to college, she can choose now to be a lifeguard. And she still does. Um, but now she can focus on school without the stress of uh, facing food insecurity. She can really spend time on things that she really wants to do. And so, as Michael mentioned earlier, we really thought about the idea to uh, focus on, or the YMCA was really providing a lot of assumptions on Matthew and uh, the type of lifeguard that we were designing for, but what we came across was something completely different. Um, and so when we were talking about these solutions, um, some of the lifeguards in the room were um, not especially reactful or reacting well to um, the community programs because they felt that their um, sense of community was already developed. And so when we introduced the idea of the scholarship program, they expanded on it and we eventually came up to our Invest in Me and Invest in You program. 
And so um, one of the quotes that we held on to near the beginning of the project was, you don't quit the job, you quit the people. The Y was really good at creating an atmosphere in which lifeguards could develop a community and professional skills, but lacked the ability to help lifeguards pursue education beyond lifeguarding. And so through our work with the YMCA, we were able to empower the organization to address this issue in a process that was collaborative and beneficial for our students, as well as the stakeholders. And throughout this process, we also noticed that because of the work that we were doing and the problem areas that we were finding, um, the stakeholders themselves were starting to innovate and starting to think about ideas on how to address these other issues that we were coming across. And we felt that this was really beneficial because it developed a really good working relationship between our studio and uh, the YMC our local YMCA. And as you can see, um, this is happening across the nation with DFA studios everywhere. Um, you have studios from Washington University, NYU, all, all across the nation really working with their local YMCAs to provide uh, a really good working relationship and innovation in their local communities. And so one of the quotes that I'm, I'm really fond of is through the collaboration, I believe both organizations were able to live out their missions to serve the community in a more impactful way. And I'm excited to see what the future impact will be as a result of our work together. And I'm hopeful there will be continued opportunity for collaboration between the two organizations in the future. And so with that, I'm gonna end here and hand it off to Devika Patel, a DFA board member. Hi, everybody. Um, so um, thank you all for being here and thank you um, for that great presentation, guys, on your, on your work. Really inspiring stuff. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, our alumni network as an alum myself. My name is Zevika. I'm a um, uh, DFA Stanford alum from the class of 2016, and I'm currently the design director. So I work as a full-time designer at uh, San Francisco General Hospital um, as the design director of an uh, academic research center called the Better Lab. So the alumni network is um, the really the spirit of DFA um, and has grown exponentially since our founding uh, back almost 10 years ago. DFA alumni are all over the country and permeate every industry. Given the multidisciplinary nature of the undergraduate and graduate version of DFA, we see uh, DFA alumni in a variety of different industries, everywhere from design to architecture, nonprofit, um, finance, etc. Um, and have now have alumni across the country as well. The DFA alumni network is an exciting opportunity for companies to uh, really engage with a set of really talented um, design alumni. And the goal of our alumni network is really to drive the growth of DFA alumni, both in their, uh, in their professional lives, uh, with three major missions. One, being connecting alumni with the greater network. Two, being creating opportunities for alumni to coach local studios, such as the UT Austin studio you heard of just before. And three, to really increase alumni contribution, whether that's resources or um, financial resources to ensure that DFA continues to inspire uh, young people to use design for social impact. Currently, DFA alumni leadership is uh, comprised of three recent grads of both uh, under, undergraduate and graduate programs, as well as DFA itself. So um, my name is Devika, as I mentioned before. I have been on the alumni board since 2018, uh, part of one of the first iterations of the alumni board. And I'm joined this year by Lucas O'Brien and Alex, Alex Scher, who are DFA alumni uh, from UIUC and Northwestern respectively, and are currently working as designers and design strategists in a variety of different 
fields. The alumni board is focused on three different things. And I think that particularly in looking at Connect, Coach and Contribute, um, there are you know, numerous opportunities for organizations like yourselves to engage with the GFA alumni uh, network as well. Um, our three missions, like I mentioned before, are to connect alumni to other alumni, um, as well as other uh, professionals in the design and uh, great, um, other industries that our alumni tend to work in. Uh, second, coach, having our DFA alum actually support the local DFA studio members providing project and career advice. And three, contribute to DFA by um, leveraging personal contributions, partnerships with organizations like yourselves and visibility. And the alumni network is a wide-ranging network that's open not just to the alumni but to what we're calling alumni and friends uh, so we engage uh, local our local and national communities of design professionals and professionals who are really interested and passionate about using design for social impact in a variety of different ways uh, namely some of our most um, kind of outward facing and successful engagements are through um, local presentations or events where we bring together experts in different kind of design topics and design fields and invite our friends and alumni in the area to engage around these really meaningful conversations. Uh, we just had an event recently um, in San Francisco actually at LinkedIn where we talked about kind of this idea of the commons and what that means in a name in the modern day age. But as you can see from this slide, we have a variety of different ways we engage with both our alumni and our community to uh, kind of continue these, con these important conversations around using design for social impact. And of course, uh, the Alumni and Friends program doesn't just stop there in these more formal engagements. We're all about building our community and building a network of like-minded individuals. Uh, we've had a great success in bringing together smaller groups of alumni and friends for uh, both more social and um, kind of fun engagements around bringing uh, people together. Everything from uh, hosting events as uh, follow-ups to some of the larger events that we saw in the slide be before to just social gatherings where we all get together, um, meet each other, and build our own networks. And lastly, one of the, one of the really great ways to engage with DFA um, is through our DFA Summit. Uh, every year around August, we have what we call the Create Impact Conference which brings together uh, leaders and members of DFA studios from all of our member studios, as well as alumni and um, committed and engaged uh, design professionals and um, partners to our work. We um, host this uh, usually at, it, it, we host this at Northwestern University and um, bring together leaders in their, in um, you know, respective design fields to uh, engage in conversations with both their students, alumni, and other design professionals. I got to go to the Create Impact Conference last year in August. It's a fantastic experience, um, for both as a DFA alum, but also now as a professional, um, a design professional working in this space, being able to engage with really um, smart and engaging students and actually was able to make connections with students who uh, would potentially want to intern with my organization in the future. So it's a great organ it's a great conference to learn about what's going on in the world of design, social impact um, and a variety of different industries, as well as engage with some really smart people around these topics. And lastly, um, one great way one great and more uh, frequent way to engage with our alumni is through our alumni Slack, where we invite both alumni and partners and friends to um, engage. Particularly, we have a really thriving uh, job board where you can post um, jobs and get immediate um, attention from more than 200, um, oh, I think almost 300 alumni who are all um, 
have gone through our programs and also learn about what our alumni are doing in their respective fields through a alumni newsletter, which also posts jobs. So there are many ways for you to get involved if you're interested in becoming more engaged with DFA. We have the alumni Slack, as I mentioned, a Facebook group. Um, and of course, we would love for you to post jobs and recruit with us um, and ask any of these types of questions through our great and fearless leader, Alden. So with that, I'll pass it over to Deborah Daly of our DFA Advisory Committee. Thanks, Devika. Let's see, do I have control? All right, thank you so much. Um, I am so excited to tell you about my experience partnering with DFA while I was leading a global transformation project for Sodexo. And just a, whoops, yeah. <laughs> just a little bit of context, Sodexo is a global food and facility services company. Our headquarters are in Paris. They're one of the largest national companies out there. So they have 470,000 employees. They're across 70 countries. They service a million consumers in 10 segments at thousands of sites. And my role while I was at Sodexo was to operationalize a conceptual framework, uh, a framework that would enable Sodexo's mission for quality of life improvement to really embed it into the organization. And in a nutshell, it was about going a lot deeper with insight, a lot deeper with insight about our consumers, the clients, our employees, then being able to use that insight to design solutions that would impact one or more dimensions of quality of life in order to drive outcomes. Seems simple, right? Insight to outcome. But when you are working um, at a large organization, like many of you are, the ability to really transform and to drive change and the way you work is much more difficult. And so for Sodexo, the place to start was about becoming more client and consumer centric. And each segment actually approached it quite differently. Sodexo's global marketing vice president, Kevin Ruddle, actually found the best place to start to get that ball rolling. He was the one who reached out to Design for America. He turned to them as a resource to better understand student needs. And in many ways to help us, execute against this huge transformational framework. And let me share with you a little bit more than about how, how the team started to work with DFA. Great. This is about getting the ball rolling and required, it required a lot of new ways of working. So when you're going through transformation and change, it's just not as simple as putting up there, okay guys, let's go deeper with, with insight, right? Actually, our change, um, during our change, I would say the learning there, and I'm sure many of you can relate to this, our segments had a really good understanding of macro trends, high level marketing research. For example, um, some of those statistics to the left, you know, only 10% of low income, first generation students graduate in four years, billions of dollars are spent um, to on state appropriations for students who don't return for a second year of college. And then this third statistic really stood out to me. 86% of college students study alone in their dorms. Of course, it's about being able to understand those. And of course, it's about solving for those big um, challenges around student retention. But it's not enough to take action based on this statistic. To go further, we had to join up and make things more actionable. To make those more actionable, it does require a seed. And DFA and the students, they just throw the terms out there, right? Oh, let's create a how might we statement or how can we statement, and that's hugely important. But we need as organizations to understand what it means to create a how can we statement and why. The reason why is because it helps us to focus much more on solutions and perhaps even establish those boundaries. This is the type of thing that organizations who are going through change, trying to become more design thinking focused, need to understand. And that's how they helped us. 
So together with DFA and Sodexo, they joined forces um, on a national project and a challenge. How can we improve preparedness and resilience in college students? Um, if you go back, just one, one quick thing that I want to mention there too in the previous slide is you can see all the different processes and approaches that the team who just presented shared. What I will say is there are um, within teams, my, in my experience, we may hear the terms journey map, we may hear the terms research and qualitative research and synthesis, but until you really go through it and align on actually what it means to do a good solid journey map, you'll be all over the place. So again, DFA through their tools really helped us to understand contemporary tools in this space and how to do it in the right way. So if you just progress to the next slide, then I'll give you a little bit more details on some of the outcomes. So um, as Alden had shared in the beginning, it's a 12 week process. And what I can share here is sort of the end result. And I was lucky enough to be invited by Kevin for this final presentation. And it was the expo and what the teams had shared. So after going through the entire approach with DFA, trying to solve for a challenge around improving preparedness and resilience amongst college students in order to help um, retain them, there were five schools who designed new solutions to solve for that challenge. And a few things that I just wanna point out that stood out to me in regards to, to listening to the students as they shared. In the lower left-hand corner, you'll see the team from the University of Cincinnati that team realized the significance of mental health on building preparedness and resilience. But their research also showed that most students don't access the resources that are available. They designed a really cool prototype, um, something simple, a dining hall plate that had quotes about connections to other students and campus mental health resources. Easy, simple way to increase awareness at a touch point that almost every student is engaged with, right? The dining hall. Um, in the middle column there were the uh, students from Johns Hopkins University. And they tackled that very high level macro statistic around the fact that 86% um, of their students study alone. And so how do we tackle that particular problem? Well, they went through a lot more deeper research and they learned that students want to study together but they lack some impetus to reach out and find that connection. They developed an idea for students to create a bag for another student, a build a bag for a classmate. And they would fill that with quotes and goodies. And the, the, the process then would help them um, to be able to not only come together with the build, to, to build the bag, but also they would be able to kind of receive the value in the ability of actually giving it to someone else. They also created the space for the students to come together. Um, and of course they did a lot of research around it to get to that point as well. So, you know, that was an awesome experience to do with the students. And then we wrapped the day up by connecting those students, um, connecting the solutions, I would say, to our potential for growth or scalability or alignment with the Sodexo strategic initiative. So it was able to pull it all together to see what could actually take action and what the teams could use then to actually um, deliver some of those solutions. And for me, the biggest takeaway was nailing down the why. Um, the key motivations and the core student needs, which eventually helped to get to the what, to make it actionable. And so many times that's missing as a part of this process. And I wanted to say just a little bit more about that before I wrap it up and turn it back over to Alden. So if you, yeah, if you click to this next slide, I have one more story, story in regards to working with the DFA, um, but I wanted to throw this out there and, and of course you can make comments in, in the comments section too, but I just wanted to ask this question. Have you ever been part of a process where people are just throwing out ideas, seeing what sticks? Or you know, how many times have you heard leaders and teammates saying, you know what, I know what the consumers and the employees need. I work with them every day, day in and day out. I've read the reports and I know exactly what the YMC, YMCA team had said, there's assumptions or perceptions around what people think will work. And in my experience, this happens a lot. 
and people feel like they have the right ammunition and it's dangerous and it can result in spending things, money on, uh, on solutions that are less impactful. And I wanted to share this one last story about how I was able to work with uh, a DFA uh, student. And I was asked to support a project with our aviation segment and they were trying to increase employee retention in airline lounges. Oh, easy, right? And as part of uh, the process of working with DFA in the university, uh, there was a very bright student. Her name was Christine Alex. And I asked her if she'd help me. She was already in her senior year of her master's program. I knew the project she was involved in. She knew a heck of a lot more than me, and she could help me along the way to go deeper with my design thinking and experience design skills, and she, she agreed. You know what we found out, though? As soon as we started the project, the team had already started to throw out their ideas. They were already preparing to invest in some incentives to motivate employees. Um, they felt the biggest pain points were associated with the commute. Um, the security involved, in, involved with working at the airport, they had all these pre-established mental models already. But what Christine helped me to do um, was to develop a very solid approach to research. Together with the account team, we put those goals and interview questions together. But again, I wanted to share with you some things that stood out to me in regards to the, the questions we asked were very different. We asked about your journey to working at the airport. What did, you know, we needed to learn about that. What motivated them to work at the airport? Why did they come? Why did they go? And why did they stay? And here's what we learned. We learned employee retention, though not the same as employee recruitment, they are related. In other words, employees who came recommended by another employee stayed longer. We also learned um, that the commute and the pain associated with it was really had no impact. And they actually didn't even, the employees didn't even look at them as a hassle. So what this told us was that it's not just about throwing out more ideas. It's about more learnings. And the result of this was that we improved and increased the confidence in, with the team because we actually avoided spending money on a solution that would have great or less of an impact than the outcome we were ultimately trying to accomplish. So not just about new ideas, it's about new learning, but having quick access to a skilled student, even if they were finishing up some of their education was a great way for us to go further with insight and research. And let me just wrap it up here with uh, summarizing where I see some of the benefits from a partner perspective. Again, just for me and my experience, um, it really working with DFA was a great place for us to start, to start our process to transform, to become more consumer centric, even to know what the heck that means, right? It gave us quick access to very high quality students with contemporary proven skills uh, in design. And of course, the students were learning by doing, but I would say more than that, our teams and, and the teams um, within Sodexo were learning by doing, which was very important. So that was a great benefit. The second benefit is about, it's less of a risk. Um, it helped us, I think it helped the teams to really increase their understanding about what skills does it take? What approach does it take? Prior to really making every, any kind of heavy investment in design, especially if you really don't know what, what you're trying to solve for it and the value that um, someone with a design background can bring. And then the last piece for us, alignment around common definitions. What does experience design mean? Human-centered, design thinking, piloting. What is really a pilot or a prototype? And there's, there's differences between those two. Um, and then most importantly, making the insights actionable versus general. A huge shift, I think, in what it takes can create actionable insight that you can actually use to design something that's quite impactful. So it was just awesome. And I'm just so, so thrilled to be part of the advisory now uh, as a result. So with that, Alden, I'll turn it over to you and we can wrap it up. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Deb. And thanks all for uh, sharing your experiences with Design for America. 
and really touching upon um, the benefits of what it means to partner with the DFA studios uh, and student teams. The last thing I want to do before we open it up to questions is also just share the opportunity that Devika touched upon um, with the Create Impact Conference. Um, that is a sort of year, uh, yearly annual conference that we have, uh, not only for the alumni professionals, but also for students um, and partner organizations. It's three days that happens at Northwestern University. Um, and it's this really amazing experience where this sort of national network that does happen um, in a lot of ways remotely gets to come together, be together, learn all of these sort of design thinking um, skills and tools uh, through workshops, through keynote speakers, um, through networking events. Uh, it's a really special time and we're always looking for uh, organizations to come and partner with us um, and sort of shape some of the program thinking that we do. So if any interest, um, I would love to hear from folks um, about what it would look like to partner also for um, DFA Summit. Um, to enable to learn more, um, <laughs> it's funny, it's like we had technical difficulties, but now they're all moving. Uh, so thank you all for um, sort of sitting through this with us. But if you want to learn more, um, just go to designforamerica.com. Um, again, uh, we have a resource section where the process guide um, and some of the tools that we had mentioned throughout the presentation are available. Um, and then if you want to stay in touch, we're on all social media um, at Design for America. And then again, any questions or interest in partnering, learning more, please do not hesitate to email me, um, alden at designforamerica.com. Um, hopefully too, you all should be able to ask access uh, this PDF of the presentation um, and there are some links too that you can click through again to join the Slack to get on the newsletter um, and to learn more. So with that, thank you everyone uh, for being uh, here with us and uh, we'll open it up to any questions uh, if folks have. Thank you, Alden and everyone. That was really great. Um, it was great to hear about the actual work you've done for the YMCA, and I really appreciated, Deb, hearing about the value that Sodexo got out of your partnership with Design for America. So again, we're open for questions. So if any of you that at an organization might be interested in like how might you work with DFA or how might you get involved, um, any questions or clarifications, we'd love to talk to you, um, answer your questions. Um, so I'll give you a couple of minutes to put those in there. But um, Deb, uh, just trying to think of like, what do you think, um, how did you guys find out about DFA and get involved in the first place? Uh, that's a really great, great question. <laughs> I found <laughs> out, um, I found out because my team member found out um, to be honest, uh, Alden, I don't know how they even reached out to you guys to begin to begin with um, for for DFA. So I'm trying to spread the word, Catherine. That's um, mm -hmm. what I want to do too. But um, maybe you can share a little bit more about that, Alden. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think something that is, is that, that question is also making me think about of like how people get involved with DFA. Um, again, so much of our network is really focused on the students and the alumni. Um, and people are learning about it through sort of word of mouth or students being on campus sort of learning about, you know, the happenings that are going on. Um, it's been really fascinating for me as someone who is not a part of a DFA studio um, and didn't know about it until sort of like I came into this role that I'm in. Um, and something that I think is really exceptional, exceptional about the Design for America network is that it, it has something for everyone. Um, and whether you're finding out it, about it as a, as a student who's like interested in, you know, design for social good and going out into the community um, and using sort of like what you're majoring in engineering, architecture, design thinking um, and working on projects using that or you're an alumni sort of translating it into the um, your workplace or you just like find out about DFA um, and are interested in, in partnering. Uh, it's really fantastic and amazing how much of what we teach and what students are learning about design thinking and the design process um, really translates to anyone's interests, anyone's challenges, um, anyone's organizations. Um, and so for me as someone who didn't you know, participate as a student, um, coming into this network, it, it continually um, surprises me with how A, just like open and excited people at Design for America are, how passionate they are, um, and how willing they are to like ask questions um, and, and teach and learn equ in equal parts about collaborating, about you know immersing yourself in communities, acknowledging what people's needs are, um, and, and using the sort of skill sets to, to address that. Um, 
so yeah, I, I think in terms of um, who, who is DFA and who sort of gets folded in, I, I really can't uh, reiterate more how, how it is really for everyone. Um, and I think partners too are really continually surprised by what the students bring to um, when, they, when they collaborate together. Okay, Alden, we have a question that's come in um, and I think it's more for Deb, but on the Sodexo project, what were the main difficulties you found? Um, you know, main difficulties, again, for me too, right? Uh, I, you know, it was my job to take that transformational framework to share that with the segments and then for the segments to be able to do whatever they, they needed to do with it from that perspective. But I would say um, the biggest challenge, and this is just coming from my perspective, is being able to really shift from general insight to what it takes to actually make it actionable and that there's truly a process and an approach that's backed up um, with the skills that these students bring as a part of it. I truly don't think people understand deeply what, what that means and what it takes. Um, so for me, that was just my big, my big takeaway. Um, Alden, I don't know if you have anything else that you want to share about some other, or the, the YMCA too, about some challenges uh, relative to, to the project, but that for me is a big takeaway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, maybe um, Michael and Albert, do you all want to chime in about some of the challenges that um, either you all faced um, in the partnership with the YMCA was facing uh, that you all sort of uh, addressed and brought thinking to? Sure. So some of the problems that we encountered during this um, project were uh, there wasn't there were a lot of assumptions that were being made uh, from our stakeholders and a lot of things that we initially didn't uh, think about. And then I think as our research progressed, we were able to find um, more really good nuggets of information from uh, a key insights from our research that. Um, we were able to present and talk, have a conversation about with our um, with the YMCA executives and really dive deep into um, how to solve for these issues. Um, I think just mm -hmm. for overall just not being aware of certain problems and then going through them uh, was a really um, going through and understanding them was a really um, I guess intense process for us, uh, especially because we had never worked in the space before and this was like our first um year as a studio um but it was definitely a really good learning experience for all of us um and i think we actually ended up coming up with like a really good situ uh solution because of it i don't know if michael you want to expand on that uh yeah no it was it was uh incredibly helpful having established a pretty solid um connection with Brett, who is just our point of contact at the YMCA, he was always uh, really helpful. But yeah, uh, one thing about it being phase two of a project and having a lot of teams who are already looking at this space in different areas is we had to just always ground the user and go back and say, well, the lifeguards in Austin are different than the lifeguards across the country. And so let's talk to them and like really understand uh, their perspective. You know what, I'm just yeah, no. Oh, okay. one more thing too, Catherine, just quickly. You know, sometimes what I hear a lot with organizations is they get through sort of the insight and even some ideation and solutioning, mm -hmm. and then things don't get executed. I think too, the, the second project that I worked on with Christine Alex, a big takeaway for us there was some things never, they never did get to ideation. <laughs> but what did happen was they avoided, immediately made the decision not to invest um, in what they originally wanted to invest in. So mm -hmm. it was not just about more ideas. It was about new thinking and new learning that helped us too. So uh, that, that was another takeaway for me as well. All right. I just want to ask you, it hasn't been asked, but I have a question because I know there's somebody on the webinar that is not from the United States. So this is designed for America. Is there, do they ever work with international groups or are there an equivalent organization that works internationally? 
Yeah, that's a great question, Catherine. Um, we've had, I think so far in the 10 years, we've really focused on um, building out the network in the United States. There have been some um, instances where DFA has gone and partnered with other organizations um, in Singapore and in Thailand, I think are the two that are coming immediately to mind, um, where DFA is going over there and sort of, yeah, collaborating on a conference, doing design thinking workshops. Um, we don't have um, formal studios that are outside of the USA right now, but we do have um, students and alumni who are working outside of the US and sort of bringing um, the DFA mentality uh, to the locations that they're in. Um, so, th and there's always, I think, opportunity for us to be in conversation about what does it look like for DFA to sort of partner on projects that aren't um, centralized in the United States, for sure. Okay, thank you.